following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with Michigan State University. Next up on MSU Today, we'll look at the research being done at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory. Answering some of the, the, the very simple questions we can answer about our world, what exists and what does not exist. Listen in on one of the nation's top campus radio stations. Impact 89 FM, right there, music from Tokyo Police Club. Uncover the treasures within MSU Library's special collections. University libraries were very slow to start collecting them because they weren't things that teachers were assigning. And we'll travel around the globe with one remarkable student. Got a scholarship to circumnavigate the world? Yeah! Got this amazing scholarship that required going to at least five countries, hitting three continents. Welcome to MSU Today, the program that brings you inside MSU and showcases our faculty, students, and alumni. I'm Ron Collins. Michigan State University is home to the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory, and researchers there have recently identified three new isotopes that will accelerate medical and scientific research across the nation and around the world. Since the beginning of nuclear science, it's been a long-standing project even to establish what isotopes are there in nature and what combinations of neutrons and protons are actually possible. Answering some of the, the, the very simple questions we can answer about our world, what exists and what does not exist. It's a long way to prepare such a discovery. It's not just uh, happening by happenstance that you stumble over something and say, oops, it's there. The three rare isotopes that were never seen before that we discovered are magnesium-40, aluminum-42, and aluminum-43. And we ran for five days and we didn't see a single event. At that time, we were pretty much convinced that there was nothing to get. And then on the fifth day, one evening, somebody at the main console saw one dot at the proper space where we would expect magnesium-40. We very quickly then looked at all the parameters and verified that this is actually a magnesium-40 event. So it was a very exciting evening. Any isotope that we might make here in the laboratory, we have to start from some a stable isotope that we already have by accelerating them and bringing them to a very high velocity in our cyclotron system reacting them with another material and break them into pieces and then identify each one individually with, with absolute certainty. The really simple way we like to explain it is by saying that we measure pennies on a jumbo jet that's about to explode. And that's our analogy for it. Uh, what that means is that we weigh really, really small particles that are produced at the cyclotron here. And I say the jumbo jet's about to explode. What I mean by that is these very rare particles, isotopes that we measure here, um, often don't live very long. One of the important features of being on the campus is that we, we always are interacting with young people, that we have undergraduate students who are studying physics maybe for the first time. And then we have graduate students who've completed their degrees and are now saying that they want a career in science. And so we want to have maximum voltage or higher voltages so we can essentially repulse these ions away from the surface but at the same time still guide them um, towards extraction and towards the experiment. And we're really here running the experiments, you know, turning on and off the cyclotron to a certain extent. The professors are there with us, you know, guiding what we do, but we do a lot of it ourselves. And then when I was chopping around for graduate school, I just joined the ranks and I like it. Um, I like my group, my advisor, um, and the resources, yeah, the, it's, they're quite large here. When I talk to students that uh, actually have a plan to continue a career in physics or even nuclear physics, I always tell them that this is the best place you can be. When I was a student here, I liked the atmosphere, and also it's one of the top three facilities in the world, I think, where you can do this kind of research. There's just no better place to do basic research than on a university campus which is equipped to house state-of-the-art facilities. Nuclear scientists and engineers with their partners have transformed knowledge about the properties of atomic nuclei into tools for medical diagnosis and radiation therapy. 
detectors for national security, and numerous other remarkable technologies, many of them the results of work at this laboratory. By developing better models to understand our world, we have a better chance to conquer the world in terms of finding ways how to improve it. That's always the hope, is that somebody will take what you've done and do something better with it, building on it and taking it further. That's what science is all about. To learn more about these discoveries and the work being done at the NSCL, go to www.nscl.msu.edu. Next up, we'll hear how students express themselves in a forum all their own. College, the perfect place for students to explore their interests and to express themselves. So what happens when students have the chance to express themselves with a microphone? Well, a lot of awards and some pretty original programming is the result. Students from multiple disciplines take turns as the newest campus DJs at WDBM The Impact, MSU's campus radio station. What's good, East Lansing? It's your boy, William Ketchum, a.k.a. The Critic. You are listening to The Cultural Vibe, Impact 89 FM. There is a stereotype of a college radio station where, in a sense, it's kind of a playground and, and everybody gets to, to do what they want. But I think we owe it to our staff and to our listeners uh, to be the best that we possibly can be. What we do here at the station actually matters. It's being broadcast 30 miles in every direction. We try to really take that responsibility seriously. Impact 89 FM, that was The Vines with Get Free. And the impact really gives the students some responsibilities. We know when we're supposed to do a talk break or play a request by this. So this is kind of like our Bible. A radio station is only as good as their worst disc jockey. And as, as I've said to most of our people, you don't want to be that worst disc jockey. Each one of them is striving constantly to make their show this week better than it was last week. But because a new song comes up every week, and in a day and age where uh, you can download songs legally, of course, you know, on iTunes and get them cleaned, it's really a DJ's best friend. In addition to training on professional presentation, Impact DJs learn to use state-of-the-art equipment, including a touchscreen-operated digital control system to store, schedule, and playback thousands of songs and promos. But they also maintain an impressive CD library. Turn the camera this way. See all this? This is like a tiny section of what we have. Here, come here. You're gonna follow me to my favorite room in this entire station. It's just beautiful. This entire room, our underground library. We have old stuff, we have Ramones in here, we have Slipknot in here, we have tons of R.E.M albums, these are all full of CDs. It's just like the coolest thing ever. Another part of the station's mission is to provide the community with unique and diverse programming. So outside their daytime college rock format, WDBM has specialty shows featuring everything from jazz to hip-hop to world music and talk radio. We also like to bring community members on uh, during our airtime to talk about what's going on in the area. Whether it be a theater company or, you know, the Horseback Equestrian Club, they come on and basically just talk about what they're doing. It's all about connecting with the community and making it relevant to them. Under Professor Reed's supervision, a hand-picked staff of dedicated student directors run the station and manage the 100-plus student volunteers who make up the news, production, promotion, and on-air staff. I really want to see promoing other stuff that's going on throughout the week. Especially Our students come from all majors across campus. Political science and theory majors, journalism, computer science, communications. Vet school, history and English. What's your degree in? Human biology and Spanish, actually. Well, I think we have a lot of opportunities for them to improve themselves just as individuals, either through leadership, uh, we have a great news program, a promotions program, etc. I think working at The Impact has prepared me immensely for anything I want to go into, really. I've learned so much more than just putting music on the radio. Well, the show has been everything positive in my life right now. Everyone comes here with an interest in music to begin with. That's the part that perhaps draws all these people together. But when they walk away, they have experiences for a common good. 
So even though we've got a number of people that have graduated and may never again work in radio, the camaraderie, the team spirit, the excitement carries with them. Since WDBM first signed on the air in 1989, hundreds of students have worked with Gary Reed at the Impact. They've been on the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for close to 20 years. Impact 89 FM, right there, music from Tokyo Police Club. Your English is good is what that's There is a legacy uh, and even a heritage that's been developed by all of the people that have come before that uh, a new person entering the station feels the obligation to, to be good. And everyone on this wall back here that has signed this wall has created this foundation that I have come into and I've learned from. And you know, this December I'll be signing my name up there and I hope that you know, someone next year will be feeling the same way I do right now. WDBM was named College Radio Station of the Year by the Michigan Association of Broadcasters six times in the past seven years. And our congratulations to Gary Reed, who was recently inducted into the Michigan Broadcasting Hall of Fame. When we come back, we'll stop by the MSU Library for a little pop culture. Welcome back. The MSU Library System has well over 4 million volumes, ranging from the literary classics to books and papers on current research. But for some, it's what's in the basement that's most intriguing. This is the Special Collections Division. There is extra special security uh, in here. Truth, justice, and the American way, <laughs> and correct comics organization. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Special Collections is where the University Library holds its rare books. Sometimes the physical artifact of a book is important to keep. The first true American cookbook is preserving a, a part of our past. And this was done in the, in the late 19th century. And uh, they're beautiful for the information inside of them. These are both first editions. There's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and there's Adventures of Tom Sawyer. To be part of preserving um, important books to me is, is one of the finest things that an individual can do. My job is to organize uh, one of the world's biggest collections of comic books, Captain America. When I get a, a chance to buy, I figure, okay, let's fill it in. If I buy all, everything I can, here's the Hulk. The comic books are, um, are part of who we are. And that's spring 1941. And it's part of our heritage, part of our culture. Horror comics from the 1950s. And they can show a great deal about who we are. Amazing Heroes. Comic books are something that most people remember through their whole lives. It's a kind of reading that's been lifelong. Will Eisner was one of the first graphic novelists. I'd like to emphasize that our collection is a global collection. To get in one place 200,000 comic books from all over the world uh, is something that's unparalleled. There's books here in the library that you can only find in Mexico. We have Korean comics, French comics, German comics, Mexican comics. It's global in nature. We have up to 40,000 comic books from other countries. Lucky Luke, in this case, we're preserving this literary form um, in its worldwide expression. Here's a big popular one called Buddy Longway. We have scholars travel from all over the world to read our comics. Desperate Dan. The comic art collection in particular, as well as all the other collections within the Russell Nye Popular Culture Collections, are not necessarily what university libraries traditionally collected. University libraries were very slow to start collecting them because they weren't things that teachers were assigning. MSU understood some 30, 40 years ago that um, the stuff of everyday life was important to collect and preserve as well. And almost everything I do or that I've done for the last 30 years is being done for the first time in a library. So as a result of that we think we have one of the finest collections now of this material. almost feel like a pioneer. We have quite a few of those expensive glamour issues, key issues you call them. There's an old Superboy. Every year or so, uh, some major museum will send us its documentation and a request for this, that, or the other thing. Wonder Woman's been out twice now. Maybe three times, I don't quite remember. <laughs> when a scholar comes in and asks for an American comic book, we have over two-thirds of what they ask for. Um, it's rather touching to see these students um, ask for comics and then look at them in our reading room. No, most people think it's a really cool job, and, uh, most, and a lot of people would like the job. 
it's a great joy to see them use it and appreciate uh, what we do here and what Michigan State University has done for them by providing these books. For more information on MSU Special Collections, go to msu.edu and search for Special Collections. Next up, we'll profile a student whose passion for studying abroad took him around the world, literally. We've all heard the phrases, our world is shrinking or it's flat. Whatever imagery you prefer, students need to know how to navigate this new reality, and MSU delivers. With 220 programs in 65 countries on all seven continents, MSU operates the largest study abroad program in the nation at a public university. Through the program, students can spend as little as a few weeks to as much as a year abroad dedicated to academics. Put your cellular phones, your phones on vibrate. It's a little nerve-wracking. We will begin the program in approximately five minutes. I'm giving a speech for the ADS on study abroad. It's a little nerve-wracking in that I um, haven't run over my speech as much as I should have. I used uh, study abroad to fulfill both my language requirement and my field experience requirement at MSU. Nick Masinski is in the spotlight. That allowed me... It's a situation many of us fear. Or cho allowed them to choose me. Speaking in front of a ballroom of over a thousand people <laughs> and cameras. Oh yeah, it's a passion of mine. But Nick takes it in stride because he knows what he's talking about. Who wouldn't want to study abroad, right? I'm here to talk to you about study abroad. Nick is a world traveler, and he's passing along his experiences to potential Michigan State students. Were the classical theorists really right about human nature? I'm telling a couple stories about uh, my study abroad. And most importantly, is the hummus as good in the Middle East as it is in East Lansing? <laughs> Some of his experiences may be funny. I actually broke my arm inside the second pyramid. Uh, <laughs> and I missed a step and landed right on my elbow. I had my photo taken with the doctors and everything because I had to document it. But he's showing these students one of the great reasons to come to Michigan State University, the chance to study abroad. Yes, I get the badge. I, I am a world traveler. And Nick has many unique stories to tell. It was cool to do riding the camel and all of that. It was the most uncomfortable saddle I've ever sat on. Mm. Petra Jordan is where on... Uh, Indiana Jones was filmed, and this is me pretending to be Indiana Jones. You know, it's pretty incredible to be walking down the street. I was going to a wedding party, waiting on the sidewalk. Uh, we introduced ourselves to the father. Saw this car covered in flowers on the side, and so he's, I mean, you can't walk by that and not get interested, right? And got to meet the bride and the groom, and then ended up in their wedding photos, and we're at their wedding reception. <laughs> got there before the bride and groom and all the family was outside and when the bride and groom came up the band started playing the drum was really powerful a drum you could feel that that's like kind of pushing us up the stairs and then um the father pushes both me and my friend who were there into the center of the crowd i was able to celebrate with them because i had learned the language and made real friendships with people. Nick got the chance to visit ancient worlds. I got a scholarship to circumnavigate the world. Yeah. I got this amazing scholarship that required going to at least five countries, hitting three continents in at least 10 weeks. He had the opportunity to climb Mount Sinai. So we started climbing at midnight, pitch dark. Finally got to the top of the mountain at like three o'clock in the morning and slept just on the rocks for two hours before the sun rose. It was amazing. And he had a lot of fun along the way. Another one of the things that I got to do was go sandboarding. We pulled out a sandboard in the middle of the desert, went cruising down the, the dune, and then um, all my friends from the top said, don't fall, he has a broken arm. <laughs> Nick's adventure is one of many. Where did I go? Yeah. Oh, I went to India. Monica Mukherjee has also studied abroad in India. And I think a lot more people find their careers to be global now. She's also speaking here in front of these students. Hi, I would like to know that too. Their shared experiences may be the reason why she and Nick get along so well. Tell them about your trip. What, to India? Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, they're engaged. When's the big day? Uh, August 16th. They were able to meet up with each other in India, where Monica was studying. Meeting up with her in a totally different place and getting to uh, experience but know each other more 
in, um, in a different place is very powerful. They plan to keep up their international experiences after the wedding. He's coming on, on my uh, scholarship. <laughs> That's the beauty of traveling and studying abroad. You gain experiences that you never would have found otherwise, and you meet people that share the same ideals. Similar but different experiences abroad that have shaped our world views. That's the message that Nick and Monica want these students to take with them. The opportunity to do something bigger than they ever thought was possible. I am really proud of my experiences and um, any opportunity to share that I, I'm really excited about. So thank you. To see more about Nick's world travels, visit his website at nickofarabia.blogspot.com and nickmasinski.blogspot.com. For more information on MSU's study abroad programs, go to studyabroad.msu.edu. Thanks for watching this episode of MSU Today. If you have comments or story ideas, please send your email to comments at ur.msu.edu. And remember, you can find more information on all these stories by searching our main website, www.msu.edu. Thanks for watching MSU Today, and remember, go green!